as Patrick mentioned, my name is Greg Nagel. I, I work for Disney Animation. Uh, so way, way back when in the dark ages of computing, and you might remember those times. It was a very, very dark time. Long time ago, very long time ago, before iPhone was released. That's how long ago it was. Um, we used shell scripts when we wanted to automate a task. And maybe we used some Apple script if we needed a, a dialogue or a, uh, some sort of alert, or maybe we needed to automate some applications, you know, make, maybe make Photoshop export stuff. Um, if we needed more than that, we might turn to another tool like, say, Real Basic, or even the unfortunately named Apple Script Studio uh, to build apps that had full GUIs, windows, menus, buttons you could click. But shell scripts are really simple. A lot of times they were basically just a list of commands you could run. You know, it's the same thing that you were doing in the terminal. You just copied and pasted those exact commands into a text file, and ta-da, you have a script. Easy to get started. And if you used Apple Script, you either loved or hated the syntax, but there really wasn't anything else like it that you could use to automate GUI apps. You used Apple Script, and it was really good for that. Um, and it, was, it really was a very easy way to, to display a dialogue to users, you know, to get them to agree to do something. But in the mid to late 2000s, this concept, this new concept called DevOps, uh, started becoming very popular. And one of the influences of the ideas around DevOps was getting systems administrators to adopt tools and practices that previously software developers had been using, to try to you know, bring those two disciplines together, and maybe systems administrators could learn from what software developers were doing. And some of the things that, they, that DevOps was, was um, promoting was stuff like this. And every one of these things got their start as a software development tool or, uh, or a practice. And you know, a lot of times they weren't changed very much from the time that, uh, that admins were expected to use it. Who, who's using Jira? Who likes using Jira? It, it was developed for software engineers, and it, it has, you know, I, the, the ideas of stories and epics and that sort of thing, I don't know how well those translate to the kind of things that we do, but um, still, in many ways, it's nice to have the same language when you're talking with other people in your organization about project management and that sort of thing. But I think overall, this sort of thing was really driven by the big tech companies like, say, Facebook and Google. Um, they had very strong software engineering you know, culture, and they wanted to bring that, that what, the, what they had learned, the engineering things that they had learned, to the rest of the organization, including the people that were managing the machines, the hardware. And another push around that same time was the idea of configuration management tools, stuff like, like Puppet and Chef. And they were originally designed to help manage Unix or Linux machines, but because Mac OS X was based on, on Unix, uh, it was a pretty easy port for a lot of those tools to, to be brought over and do some management on Mac. And these configuration management systems were based on scripting languages, generally. Uh, Ruby in the case of Shell, of um, Puppet and, and Chef, um, but also Python was out there. So now administrators were getting exposed to languages other than Shell. And they were starting to see the power that they, that they could do new things with those languages that were difficult or impossible to do in Shell, and starting to see the possibilities. And in the early days of Mac OS X, there were three non-shell scripting languages that shipped with every single Mac OS X box. You knew these three environments were available. And all of these scripting languages shared some important things that made them maybe more suitable for more complex tasks, because they were designed more like high-level programming languages. They weren't scripting languages. Yes, they were, but they were designed to be sort of full-stack programming languages that you could write anything with it, and, you know, from anything from a little automation tool to a full-on GUI app to a web app to server, that sort of thing, you could do in these languages. 
And so the, the features that made these better for software development also made it possible to do more complex things with management. So why Python specifically? You know, there were three tools there. Why did Python specifically catch on and become popular with Mac admins? And there's a few reasons. One of the first real Mac admin tool written in Python that I became aware of was Google's Pi Mac admin project. And more specifically, a tool inside that called CrankD. And CrankD was a Python script that would listen for notifications from the OS. And then you could then perform actions based on those notifications. For example, if you wanted to listen for uh, changes in the network state, did the, the, the machine go on the network, off the network, did it move from Ethernet to Wi-Fi, that sort of thing, you could get notified of those changes and then run a script. Uh, a real common thing back then was uh, we, we only wanted the proxy to be in place if we were on the corporate network, but if we w went off the corporate network, we wanted to take that proxy out. This was a way to do that. You'd have a crank D script listening for that network change and then making that change. And you could also react to things like a volume being mounted or unmounted and things like that. And this was really exciting to me because I knew of absolutely no way to do this sort of thing with just a shell script or an Apple script. Uh, it was like Python's magic. It can, it can do this stuff, and I couldn't do it with these other tools. And you know, I would even was, back then was playing with Ruby because everybody was super excited about this thing called Ruby on Rails, and it was going to take over the industry. And if you didn't know Ruby on Rails, you were going to be consigned to the dustbin of history. But and it, it's really popular today, isn't it? No, nobody's using it anymore. Um, well, I'm sure I'm sure it is is used, but it just doesn't have have the uh, the popularity it did at that time. But Ruby is a similar programming language to, to Python, but yet Python could do this other thing. And why was that? Why could Python get this integration with the OS? And it was because of this thing called Pi Objective C. And Pi Objective C is just simply a set of Python modules that it's, acts as sort of a glue between Python and Mac OS frameworks. It converts the data formats and the function calls back and forth so that you can call Apple APIs from Python. And that would be Apple APIs in things like foundation and configuration, uh, system configuration framework, the app kit framework, that sort of thing. And so that was pretty exciting to me. Because now I could use things in the OS without having to try to write something in a language like, say, Objective-C. In my hands, Objective-C is scary and crashy, and there was just no way I could write something you know, sort of robust in a language like that. I just didn't have the talent. But Python, maybe, maybe Python, much more forgiving, I could sort of figure out my way to do some of these things. Now, you may have seen this one-liner, uh, it's a very long one, uh, and it uses Python to get the current GUI user in what Ben Thomas would call an Apple-approved way. Now, this was calling Apple APIs to get the current GUI user. And this code here suffers from all the tricks needed to try to cram it into a single line so that you can more easily embed it in a shell script. But let's tear it apart a little bit and get an idea what it's doing. So we can start an interactive Python interpreter. And we can import the exact same function as the one-liner does. And we can call it. And then let's print what it generated. So we get three values back inside parentheses. That's called a tuple in Python. A tuple is just a, a collection of values. We're really only interested in that first one, so we can assign that first one to another variable using the bracket syntax like you would for a, an array, so zero-based arrays. So the first value is actually array zero. And let's print that. So we've used, in Python, we've used an Apple API to get the currently logged in user. And that was super cool. I, I mean, yes, you could do the same thing with who and just you know process the string that comes back and that sort of thing. But would it handle spaces correctly? Would it handle non-ASCII characters correctly? I don't know. This way seems more robust, safer, um, more professional. And the point here is that we're calling directly an Apple API from Python. 
And other Mac admins were excited by this sort of capability as well. And, and this led to sort of what I would call network effects. As more Mac admins worked with Python and started building tools and sharing them, then other Mac admins saw what they were doing, got excited, jumped in, also started building tools with Python and sharing them. And the more that people were doing that, and the more tools and the more code that was available, the more appealing working with Python became. And so you, we got this ecosystem that started growing. We were all working with a, a language that's more capable than Shell, but yet more forgiving than C languages, where you have to manually manage memory and working with pointers and all sorts of scary stuff like that. And that was around the time I was thinking I needed to, or I wanted to, write a replacement for the software management tool we were using at that time, which was RadMind. And um, you know, being full of myself, I thought, well, I could probably write something to replace that. But I didn't have the talent to, to do it in a C-based language, uh, or the patience, or any of that sort of thing. But I really thought, maybe, maybe I could figure out how to do it in Python. And since Python could call all of these Mac OS APIs, you know, I could, I could probably do something of fairly high quality, and, and I could do it in a language that I could wrap my head around. And more importantly, I knew that there were other Mac admins also noodling around with Python and might be able to help me as I tried to figure this stuff out. So I started, and I tried to do this. And over the next 10 to 15 years, other Mac admins also tried Python and also built some really cool tools. And here's some of them. And if your favorite one isn't up there, or there's one that you personally worked on and you're really excited about and it's not up there, I'm, I apologize, I'm sorry. I'm sure there are tons more. Uh, this was a few that I found in a, you know, that, that I thought that people may have heard of, but I know there's tons more. And I know there are ones that people wrote for themselves and never released. I mean, that's a perfectly valid thing to do. You don't have to make everything open source. If you build a Python tool that works for you internally, and you can keep it internal, you've still, you, you know, you've still solved a problem in your job. So, so if Python is so great, and it's been so successful for Mac admins, then why, Greg, why are you telling people maybe it's now it's time to move on from Python? Well, there's a few reasons. One of the main reasons Python was so appealing as a, a language that Mac admins might want to use is it was there. It shipped with Mac OS X. And more, Python or PyObjective-C was also part of what shipped with Mac OS X. So you didn't have to install anything. Every Mac that shipped had all the tools you needed to run a Python script with PyObjective-C. So you didn't have to do uh, you know, any, anything special other than get your script on that box. But Summer of 2019, Catalina Beta comes out, and in the notes, Apple says, hey, in future version of Mac OS, we're going to stop including Python and other scripting runtimes. If you rely on scripting runtimes, you probably should include those yourself, because they're not necessarily going to be there. And I took Apple seriously here. And so did a bunch of work, and by the end of 2019, we shipped Monkey 4, which included its own copy of Python 3.7. So that was a lot of work right there. Um, not only did we have to convert from Python 2 to Python 3, had to figure out a way to build a Python framework that we could ship with Monkey that installed to a location that isn't the same as the default install location. And so that was a fair amount of work, and it continues to be work because there's also security vulnerabilities you need to keep patched. Uh, there's deprecations. Python, the Python organization stops supporting older versions of Python after a few years. And so you're constantly having to move it forward, uh, keep it patched, deal with problems that happen as the thing moves forward, because sometimes there are code changes you have to make. It's, it's an ongoing thing. We get to spring of 2022, and Apple finally makes good on their threat and pulls Python from the OS entirely. 
So if you need to deploy a Python script, you have some shortcuts available to you still. Uh, Eric Gomez and the, the, the people involved with the Mac admins open source team have made a pre-configured Python framework available. Uh, you could download the installer package, and push it out with whatever software management system you have, um, and th that's being maintained by the community. So that might be an OK solution, especially for you know, internal scripts, that sort of thing. So you don't have to maintain your own Python. That's great. But all of this leads just to a lot of friction and a lot of pain. It was so much easier to use Python when Apple was maintaining it, when Apple shipped it with the OS. It just was something you didn't have to think about, background noise. Now it's one more thing that you have to make sure is in place uh, before you got to do, now you got to do some orchestration, for example, with your deployment tools. You got to make sure Python's there before your Python scripts are there. It's a pain point. And another reason here is increasingly you need to have signed code on macOS. T tools that aren't co code signed are rapidly becoming sort of second class citizens on macOS. And here's an example. In macOS Ventura, Apple introduced a new privacy protection that can affect Monkey and other tools that install software. And this new privacy protection limits what software or what processes are allowed to update or remove application bundles. So if your item has approval in the app management list, it's allowed to update or delete applications. But if it's not in that list, it might be prevented. You might see a failure when, that, when your software management system is attempting to install a new version of Firefox or, or update Slack. So this new protection had the potential to cause problems with Monkey, because Monkey is software that manages application bundles and other pieces of software. And in order to deal with this, then admins need to figure out a way to give the managed software update process the needed TCC permissions, either app management permissions or full disk access permissions. Um, and you could do that with a configuration profile. But managed software update was a Python script. And it's not really possible, maybe it is, but if it's, it's very hard, uh, I think it's impossible, to usefully give TCC permissions to a script. Instead, you have to give it to the thing that runs the script, the actual script interpreter. So in this case, you would be giving Python those TCC rights. And that feels a little scary, because now anything that used that same Python would get those same rights. So sure, a managed software update could could modify applications, but now could some, some malware script written in Python could do it as well. So that didn't seem like the right thing to do. So in order to make it possible for admins to give managed software update those permissions and managed software update only those permissions, we had to get clever. So what we did is we replaced the managed software update tool, which was a Python script, with a compiled binary that actually calls Monkey's Python and the managed software update script. Because it was a compiled binary written in Objective-C, we were able to code sign it, notarize it, all that good stuff. And then it was very easy, easy, uh, to give it TCC permissions with a configuration profile because now it was a signed binary. If that sounds complex, how we did that, it is. And, but if you're interested in the gory details of how this all works, you can check out a talk I did last year uh, in Vancouver at the Mac DevOps con conference. But dealing with this would have been so much easier. In fact, I would have had to do no, no additional work at all um, if Managed Software Center, or Managed Software Update, and the Monkey Core tools were already compiled binaries. Because it would have been very easy just to code sign that directly and not have to build this additional complexity. And I think this need to have signed code on macOS is only going to increase over time as Apple continues to add more and more protections and restrictions to what non-signed code is allowed to do on the OS. And Python scripts and scripts in any language, actually, are going to be harder and harder to support for certain workflows because they're going to run into these protections. 
So Mac admins, they're writing tools in Python, they run into issues like this, and they're starting to move away from Python. There have been very, very few new Mac admin tools written in Python recently. And as Mac admins move away from Python, we get that sort of reverse network effect. It will become less and less appealing to start something new in Python because you're going to have fewer examples, fewer other admins that can help you. Um, it, just as success breeds success, anti-success breeds anti-success. Um, but yes, it's just going to be harder to, to justify that because it's going to become more and more a niche thing to do. So if admins are moving away from Python, where are they going? And I'm seeing two or three general trends. I'm seeing a resurgence of people going back to writing shell scripts to solve their problems. And there's a lot of advantages to working in shell. And here's some of the reasons you might do that. Um, shell's a very popular language. There's a lot of admins that know at least some shell. And shell's cross-platform. So maybe there are Linux admins in your organization that can help you with shell projects, that's that sort of thing. And this is super important, too. If you're starting a new project that maybe you want to make open source and you want to have a large number of people that can help out, picking a language that a lot of people know is a really good idea. I mean, big example, Installimator. Stallimator is written in Z shell or Z shell if you're British, and it has it's a huge number of contributors, like over 150 people that have contributed uh, code to Installimator. And I would guess that if that wasn't the case, if you didn't have all those contributors, it wouldn't be nearly as useful because it supports tons and tons and tons of applications. And if only one or two people were working on it because they'd picked uh, you know, a language that was, was not as well known, they wouldn't have had as many external contributors and it wouldn't have been able to, to support as many applications as it does today. So it was a really good choice. And here's a few recent Mac admin tools that have been written in a shell language. And they're all active projects. They've all had updates in the last few months. Some have been updated as recently as in the last week or so. So we can see that at least for some types of tools, shell is a perfectly valid choice. And you might be thinking, OK, sure, fine, uh, Apple pulled Python, but you know, I really need some of these language features. Uh, I, need, I have complex data structures I'm working with. There's this great Ruby library that's going to help me talk to Jamf or whatever. Uh, so sh could I use one of these other languages? And I'd say, at your own risk, maybe. Sure, Apple hasn't pulled Ruby or Perl from the OS yet, but they, they're, they're saying they're going to. Uh, Perl, there is one uh, tool that's still shipping, I checked, uh, on macOS that makes use of Perl that if that ever gets rewritten or goes away, I think then Perl is finally gone. Does anybody know what that is? It has to do with ARD. It's the kickstart script that you use to configure ARD, it's all Perl. If you take a look at it, it's, it's, it's Perl. And I wonder if that is one of the reasons Perl has stuck around, is they just don't want to have to rewrite that script. So the other direction that developers have headed, especially if they need access to, to Mac OS frameworks, or they need GUI elements, they want to actually write a full app, um, is toward compiled languages. And these developers have used a variety of languages. Uh, Go is really a very strong choice, especially if you're writing code that is going to run on the server. It's cross-platform. It's very easy to write Go for Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, and there are other possibilities, but Swift has a lot of momentum. And so why should you consider using Swift as a Mac admin? I think. Swift checks a lot of the same boxes that Python does or did. And even up there, you'll see a little X next to scripting language, but there's also a little asterisk next to the, the, the X. And, and this is because one of the nice things about scripting languages is that they can be used interactively. You know, when you're trying to figure out how something works, 
or you're playing around with a sort of a new concept, it's really cool to just be able to open up a shell and, and start typing and start just playing around with it interactively and try it out. For example, if I want to play for so with something in Python, I can just start a Python interpreter in the shell and try it. And here, I, want, I was trying to figure out how to use the OS uname function. So we can import OS and just type OS uname and see what comes back. And there's, oh, look at all this fun stuff. And that thing that comes back is what's called a named tuple. So I can try OS uname machine. Oh, look, I get back the architecture of the machine. So if I run this on an Intel machine, it probably comes back with something like x, x86 underscore 64 or something like that. So it's just sort of an interactive way to play with, with new parts of, of, of a language or with libraries, that sort of thing, and kind of get a feel for how they work without having to like write a whole bunch of code. You're just playing around in a shell. But you can do that with Swift as well. You can type Swift REPL. REPL stands for Read, Evaluate, Print Loop. I know it's, I, I, why not just Swift Shell? That would be easier. But you can type Swift REPL, and you get sort of a shell. And again, you can just type things into it and play. So here, I thought I'd play around with uh, Apple's foundation framework, and there's some functions in there that to get the, the name of the current user and the home directory of the current user. And again, we are playing now with Apple frameworks in sort of a scripting language. Um, I mean, you could take some of this stuff and stick it into a text file and run it like a script. And that's fine if you're playing around or testing, but you don't want to try to deploy these. And the reason why you don't want to use Swift as, as a scripting language for deployment is in order to run this stuff, you either have to have Xcode or the command line development tools installed locally on the machine. It won't run on a you know out of the box Mac. So don't I would not recommend deploying shell scripts. Fine for playing around, fine for learning, but anything that you deploy, compile it. Compiled code is what you want. But you don't have to take Greg's word for it. I mean, Joel Rennick thinks you should use Swift. And Armin Briegel really really, really want you to use Swift. And if I can't convince you, Armin's going to try again Friday after lunch. So other people and other projects have blazed a path. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, Nudge. Who uses Nudge? Nudge is a really popular tool to try to prod our users into installing their Mac OS updates. And Eric Gomez wrote it, and originally the first version of it was in Python. And as he worked on it and wanted to do more, he realized, ah, oh, this is going to be much easier to do if I switch to Swift and Swift UI. So it's made a, a migration from Python to Swift. Outset, who uses Outset? Yeah, not as many, but still, people have heard of that. It's another tool, and it, what it does is it it's sort of a framework for running scripts at certain times. It really, like, if you install Outset, you can then have, you have a folder and you can put scripts in it, and they will all run it at, say, boot time. Or there's another folder, if you put scripts in it, they will run when a user logs in. So if you've got scripts you want to trigger at certain times, uh, certain events that happen in the OS, Outset's a really great tool to help you do that. And it was originally written in Python by Joe Chilcote. And a few years ago, a year and a half ago or so, Bart Reardon made a new version that was written in Swift. And there are several other tools that have made this transition from uh, Python to Swift. Uh, Mac, the Mac uh, local admin password solution was originally in, in uh, Python. It's now in Swift. But there's another one I really want to talk about that hasn't finished the transition yet. It's in the middle of that. Monkey actually did start moving to Swift many, many years ago. Um, I began work on Swift versions of the GUI apps, um, Managed Software Center and uh, Monkey Status, uh, several years ago, back in the, I want to say the summer of 2018. And I did that because I wanted to learn Swift, and it, it always helps me to have something concrete to work on. 
So I wanted to play around with Swift. Uh, but there was also some stuff that Apple was doing with AppKit, some new features with the, the web view and that sort of thing that I wanted to implement in Managed Software Center, and I thought they were gonna be, it was going to be really hard to do in PyObjective-C, which actually brings me back to another reason to move away from Python and PyObjective-C, in that PyObjective-C is a great bridge for the Objective-C part of Apple's APIs, but as Apple gets more Swifty, with their APIs, it becomes harder and harder and harder to, to use Python to call those APIs. So I'm thinking, I want to get ahead of the curve here. I want to learn Swift. Why don't I see if I can uh, port the GUI tools from, they were written in Python, PyObjective-C uh, apps, to Swift. And in spring of 2019, I released Monkey 3.6, which included the Swift versions of Monkey Status and Managed Software Center. And you'd think maybe then, after doing that, I would have started work on a Swift port of the rest of the Monkey tools. I really thought it would be a lot of work. And I wasn't really quite sure it was worth it. I was really, at that time, very suspicious of where Apple was going with their choices about around management tools. And it really was looking like maybe MDM was going to be the only way you could do any sort of management on Mac OS going forward. And so I had this fear that I was going to spend well over a year porting the monkey tools from Python to Swift, gaining no new functionality, just changing the code base, at about the same time Apple was going to go, OK, you can't use that anymore. You have to do only MDM. So I just kind of set it to the side. And um, then other stuff started happening in the world. And um, I just found myself kind of distracted by stuff that was happening. I found myself working on other projects that had nothing to do with Monkey, uh, stuff like supporting remote users and figuring out how do you do high-speed remote access to Linux modeling stations if you're an animation studio when your users could be at home on a crappy uh, you know, DSL connection, that sort of thing. Um, I did continue to work with Swift. I had to write a few uh, new internal tools which I used uh, Swift for. Some of them had GUIs, some of them were command line only. Um, but I kept, kept noodling around with Swift and doing new stuff with that. And then finally, this past June, I was at the Mac DevOps conference in Vancouver, and Bart Reardon and Nindy Gill were there. And they're both from Australia. I won't hold that against them. Um, but they both also use Swift a lot. That Swift is their primary coding language these days, and I was talking with them, and I was talking with other people at the conference, and I just got this feeling, yeah, I'm being left behind here again. I really should probably figure out how I can jumpstart this and, and, and get back to working with, with Swift and Monkey. And so, came back from the conference, like a couple days later, opened up Xcode, started a new project for the command line tools, opened up the the Python source code editor side by side, and just started porting things. Like, oh, here's a function. Can I make that work in Swift? Oh, that's cool. Can I make this whole module work in Swift? Can I make this whole tool work in Swift? And so slowly, bit by bit, started porting code. Some days made a ton of progress. Other days would run into a wall and just have to put it away for a bit. But the important thing is I finally started on it. And what have I learned in that time? In a large project, it's a really good idea to split the source code up into multiple files or modules. You don't want to really have one, one source file that has 9,000 lines of uh, code in it. You want to be able to split it up so you can kind of mentally navigate, and it, they're smaller bite-sized pieces. It also makes it easier to like maybe reuse pieces of the code that way. And the Python monkey, the Python version of monkey does this. It puts the, mon the Python code into a monkey lib module. So we've got all these separate little files inside something called monkey lib. But doing this sort of thing, especially in Python, adds some complexity that you have to deal with because once you start putting the code into separate files, if you've got code in this file that needs to call code in that file, you have to import it. You have to explicitly tell the code, hey, we're going to be using code in this other file here. So if I need to call code from the Adobe Utils module, I have to explicitly 
say in this file, we're going to do that. We're going to call some code from the Adobe Utils module. So, so import that for me, please. And this can lead to some confusion and some, some stuff that you have to be very careful about. And the example I'm going to give you here is a little contrived, but hopefully it will um, explain the, the problem a little bit. So we've got two different Python modules here, module A and module B. And in module A, the first thing we do is we import module B. And we have to do that because we are calling code from module B in two places here. So there's two places we're calling functions in module B. So that is why we have to import module B inside our module A source code. But I did a bad job of designing this, and so module B also needs to import module A because it's calling some code for module A. And then if we try to run this, um, Python gets really unhappy, says, I can't, do, I can't make any sense out of this, and it's most likely because you've made a circular import. So module A imports module B, imports module A, imports, and it just can't figure it out. You don't really have that problem in a Swift project. So here we've got a main source code file, main.swift, and it's calling code in the module B Swift file. So we're calling a function that's defined in module B, function B. And we're also calling another function. And again, not super great code design, but we're doing the opposite thing as well. Code in our module B is calling code defined in main. So yes, not great code, or code organization, a little confusing, but it works. Swift doesn't have any problem figuring that out. It, it, it's, it's, partially, it's the difference between a compiled language and an interpreted language. It's also that the namespace is flattened. And so what does that mean? Um, let's talk a little bit about naming, which is one of the really unsolved problems in computer science. Naming and off by one errors, off by two errors. Um, so again, in Python, we should define functions in separate files. And so here's a run function in the monkey lib dot installer module. So monkey lib installer has a function called run. And managed software update imports that installer module, and later in the code it calls it. Installer dot run, do something, right? The run fu function is called. Now we're calling it with the name of the module prepended. So it's installer dot run. It's not just run, it's installer dot run. That makes it pretty clear where the function is defined, maybe gives us a little bit of more of a clue about what it's doing, because if the function was just called run, maybe you would be like, I don't know what it's doing. Um, so this is an example of namespacing, where we, where we kind of, you know, it's like, I'm not the only Greg in the world, but once we namespace and we put the Nagel on it, okay, that narrows down more which exact Greg we're talking about. The same deal. We have a lot of run functions, but no, this is the installer run function. Okay, and that's important because very close by in, this, in, in managed software update, we have another run function that we call, but it's defined in the OS installer module. And you can kind of guess, oh, this is, this is code that runs the OS installer versus running Apple's package installer. But we can easily tell them apart because we use the full naming. We got, we've got os.run, I mean, installer.run and os installer.run, two different things. In Swift, we don't, at least by default, call functions by anything other than their simple name. So that means if I define a function called run in an installer.swift file and another run function in an OS installer.swift file, and then in a third file I try to call one of those functions, the compiler is very unhappy because it doesn't know which one we mean. Ambiguous use of run. Uh, which, which, do you, which one are you talking about? And you can't just stick the the file name in front, that's not legal syntax in uh, Swift. And while there are ways to do namespacing in Swift, it's just easier to give the, the function unique names. So as porting this, instead of the Swift version of the function being called run, I named it do installs and removals. Yes, it's a longer name, but it's actually better descriptive of what the function actually does. And so it's a unique name that doesn't conflict with a run function somewhere else. And we can then call it from the code without confusion. I tend to use dictionaries a 
a lot in my Python code. It's one of the like key features of Python that that makes it mo so much more interesting and useful to use than than a lot of the shell languages. And dictionaries are very convenient for working with Apple property lists or p lists. It's really easy to read in a p list and you get a Python dictionary back. And dictionaries are super useful when you're dealing with complex data. What you see up here is sort of a simplified or condensed version of information about an item in a monkey repo. It tells me what catalogs it's in, uh, what's its name, where do I find the installer for it, that sort of thing. Version, very important. But because it's a, I can take that data and I can stick it into a single variable and I can pass it around. It's a, it's, it's a way to, to simplify handling the, this data. Instead of having to pass around six or seven different variables to describe this item, I can pass around one. So in Python, we can just assign that, val that dictionary to a variable. And then we can do something like, just give me the name of that item, or just give me the version of that item. And if we run that, get exactly what we expect. Uh, we can do a really simple translation of that code into Swift. Syntactically, this is correct. It looks really, really similar to the, the Python code. But if we try to run it, we get some warnings. Uh, what do those mean? L well, let's. Let's try to this, do this interactively. Let's take advantage of that Swift REPL and see if we can figure out what was going on there. So we'll start up the, the Swift shell, and we'll paste in our dictionary definition. And then we'll hit return, and we get an error. Hmm, what does this error mean? Well, there's a really fancy word, heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. Heter what the heck does that mean? Um, Different in kind, unlike in What Swift is complaining about here is we've got this item where the dictionary has values of all sorts of different types. And so it's telling us, I can only make sense of this if I interpret what you've given me as a dictionary where strings are the keys and the value can be anything at all. And that's fine, but did you mean to do that? Swift is like, mm, that seems a weird thing to do. I want to be sure that's, that you meant to do that. So to, to fix that in our code, we have to explicitly tell us, yes, yes, this is what we mean. We're creating a dictionary here where the keys are strings, but the values can be anything at all. And we run that. Swift is much happier. Uh, so now we've got a value inside a Swift dictionary. Let's print it. Let's print the name. Hmm. It's not exactly what I expected. Let's try a different value. OK, what's going on here? It turns out that whenever you try to get a value back out of a Swift dictionary, you get an optional value. And what an optional is, is it's telling you this could be nothing, this could be nil, this could be undefined, or you could get a real value back. And this is useful because if you try to get a value for a key that doesn't exist, you get the nil value. So this is a way to find out if that key is even defined. But it does mean that you've got a little extra overhead every time you're trying to pull a value out of a dictionary. So Swift kind of puts a flag around it and says, yeah, there's a value, but I can't guarantee there always will be. So that brings us to optionals. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, uh, Armin has talked about them in the past. He may talk about them again. Who knows? But quickly, um, it's, it's just a wrapper around something that warns the compiler and warns you that there may not actually be a value here, that it could be a string or it could be undefined. It could be an integer or it could be undefined. And so there's this concept in Swift of unwrapping an optional. And basically, it's, it's forcing you to be careful. It's forcing you to say, I need to double check that this is not undefined before I do anything with it. And a really common way to deal with optionals in Swift is this thing called if let, which if you've used any other language, it, it's a really weird combination of words together. But it basically means if item name has a value, assign it. Why did we not? OK, I hit the wrong button. If item name has a value, assign it to name. 
And then we can, we can very safely print name because we, it's guaranteed that it will have a value. If it doesn't, we drop into the else clause and we could print unknown. So we've, we've added some safety around it uh, just to, to um, prevent us from accidentally doing the wrong thing. There are other ways to do, the, to do uh, optional safely. This is called a nil coalescing operator. It basically means use the value on the left side, or left side unless it's nil, otherwise the value on the right side. So give me the value out of item name, but if it's, if it's not defined, then give me unknown. And if you, um, if you want to know more about that, you could ask both Armin and uh, Joel later. So we'll use the nil coalescing operator here to deal with the optional values. And now we get what we expect. There's more, but I'm looking at the clock. And I'm going to do a little skipping here, um, or at least go through this a little faster. Um, another thing, it, because we have defined this thing as uh, a dictionary that can, can hold anything, uh, Python doesn't have a problem with that. Right here, we're asking, does, does uh, item name start with Google? Sure, so this is a Google product. But if we do the same thing in Swift, again, Swift gets really unhappy. And this is because it doesn't know that what's going to come back from that dictionary is a string. It could be something else. So the type any, which is not string, can't legally call the function has prefix, because integer doesn't have a prefix, and Boolean doesn't have a prefix. Um, we've, we've told Swift that the dictionary value is anything. And it truly is. We've got arrays, we've got strings, we've got integers, we've got booleans in this dictionary. Um, and so we can't legally call that, that function. The way we fix that is something called an optional coercion. And what that means is that try to get a string value from this, but if you can't, give me a nil. And then we use that uh, optional nil coalescing operator. And if you get the nil, give me an empty string. So very complex. But again, we're being very safe about how we handle these values. And again, if we run it, now we finally get the, the thing that we want. Adds a lot of code complexity, but you, but, and it's kind of tedious to write, but you know that your code isn't going to crash during running because you forgot to test for a, a nil value, that sort of thing. I'm going to skip over list comprehensions. Um, they're a really cool feature in Python. If you're super interested and you want to know more about how you convert Python list comprehensions to Swift uh, filter and map functions, I can give you a little private class between uh, sessions, I'll say, but we'll skip over it for today. So zoop, 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 you know, I've got to go fast now with all these stupid animations. Oh, I, actually, we'll slow down on one. Um, we'll get there. So we're, we're doing all sorts of, of, uh, of uh, transformations of, of arrays here. And the last one is the cool one. And that's where we take the fruit and we uppercase it, but only if the last letter starts with A. And what do we get? <clears throat> um, let's. All right. So how's the Swift port of the monkey tools coming along? The command line and background tools in monkey have about 30,000 lines of, of Python code. So far, I've written about 20,000 lines of Swift code. So you're thinking, ah, he's about 2 thirds done. Yeah, I wish. Um, I, I really don't know. It, it's, it's, it's also probably I've ported the 20,000 easiest parts first, and the, the hard parts has yet to come. Um, as, as I'm doing that, I'm having to remove stuff because I just don't want to port it. And I'll go through some of the things I'm removing. Um, you can't install configuration profiles anymore uh, with, uh, since OS 10 or OS 11 Big Sur. Um, I don't, don't really want to test all the old Adobe package formats. The current ones mostly work as is, so good enough. Um, this is pretty much superseded by the fact that on Apple Silicon, you can't install Apple updates without a, owner, a volume owner password. A um, couple other package info types that just, we don't use them anymore. Um, and here's a big one. Already, Monkey doesn't really install Apple updates on Apple Silicon. I don't see the number of Intel Macs increasing 
over time, so it probably doesn't make sense to port that functionality over as well. And one last one, maybe, is there's two different ways to install a upgrade of Mac OS on uh, using Monkey. One pretty much only works on Intel, which is start OS install. The second one works on both Intel and Apple Silicon, so for a similar reason, I may not bother porting the start OS install stuff. So let's do a very quick demo to prove that some of this stuff works. And so let's get it a little even a little bigger here. I've got a uh, directory full of. I'm going to tell you that there's Swift versions of these things. I can't prove it, but I can give a little bit more um, evidence. So these are universal binaries. They're not Python code. If I were to do the, the same thing for uh, the stuff sitting in the user local monkey folder, so let's say make catalogs, it knows it's Python. So it's some sort of compiled code. You'll have to trust me that it's Swift. Um, so monkey import works. I can, uh, I can import um, a package. Lots of hitting return here. Sure, go ahead, import it. That looks good. Nah. Sure. So that's not terribly interesting. Let's look at, let's look out here. We got Google Chrome, so let's So now it's gone. Yeah, good, yes. Yay, no more Google. Um, so let's run manage so the, the Swift version of managed software update. Right, notice that Google Chrome is gone, downloaded a new one. It tells you you're going to, and install only. Bing, it's back. So managed software update works in Swift. All right, uh, I had a longer demo, but we're running out of time. So let's go back. Let's see, yep. So I got one more slide. Oh, that one. Uh, thank you. Now, 